The Naval Academy Museum presents a history of the Navy in 100 objects. The arrival of the 20th century coincided with the arrival of the modern Navy. The race for control of the Pacific accelerated at a feverish pace, with Germany, Great Britain, Japan, and the United States sending fleets into the region to claim forward military bases. Around the globe, naval arms races were underway, with the world powers struggling to maintain maritime superiority. The United States, and therefore the Navy, found itself in the thick of the race for control in the Pacific. Starting with the opening of Japan by Matthew Perry in 1854, and culminating with the United States gaining control of the Philippines after the Spanish-American War. The lessons demonstrated by the American naval victories during the Spanish-American War were not lost on the rest of the global powers. And new ships and new designs were being churned out by the hundreds. The difficulties of operating massive fleets at the end of supply chains around the world were also not lost on policymakers, and a new focus was on resupply as well as the establishment of forward naval operating bases. Japan in particular rose to power in the Pacific at an incredible rate, defeating China and its outdated navy in the First Sino-Japanese War in 1894 in a stunning demonstration of the Japanese increase in naval capability since the Meiji Restoration began in 1868. The Japanese had never fought a European foe, however, but in the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese naval fleet crushed the Russians in a series of naval battles that culminated with the brilliant Japanese victory at the Battle of Tsushima from May 27th to the 28th, 1905. The Russian fleet was destroyed, and this would lead to the Treaty of Portsmouth, signed in September 1905 and brokered by former Assistant Secretary of the Navy and now President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt would receive a Nobel Peace Prize for his mediation efforts. The victory firmly cemented Japan as a leading power in the Pacific, and countries redoubled their efforts to build up their navies. The U.S. Navy's presence in the region, for all of its success in the Spanish-American War, remained limited, however. In light of the Japanese victories over the Chinese and Russians, and a degradation of relations between the U.S. and Japan after the Treaty of Portsmouth, President Roosevelt decided to send a message to the world about the naval power of the U.S. At the same time, the Russians had been destroyed after sending their fleet 18,000 miles around the world to meet the Japanese. And Roosevelt wanted to make sure that the U.S. Navy was capable of going that same distance. Shortly before the fleet's departure, Roosevelt stated his mission for the fleet, including that he wanted all failures, blunders, and shortcomings to be made apparent in time of peace and not in time of war. Anti-Japanese sentiment was also high in the United States due to domestic economic pressures. And Roosevelt knew that the U.S. naval forces in the Pacific weren't ready for a conflict. But he wanted to demonstrate to Japan and the other powers that the U.S. had the capability to send ships anywhere. Rear Admiral Evans, the first commander of the fleet, perhaps put it best, saying that his ships were ready at the drop of a hat for a feast, a frolic, or a fight. The Great White Fleet consisted of 16 battleships, the most modern in the world, and 14,000 sailors. All of the ships had been built since the Spanish-American War. In one of the greatest logistical achievements of the U.S. Navy, the ships sailed 43,000 miles over a period of 14 months, making 20 port calls on six continents. The visits resulted, in general, in improvements in diplomatic relations with countries around the world, especially with Japan. It also demonstrated the various deficiencies of the ships during long-term deployments. The ships were refitted later on with improved capabilities soon after the voyage. 
and perhaps most notably, the color of U.S. warships was changed after the voyage to gray. Not surprising, given the probable difficulties of keeping coal-burning ships white. But the real enduring result of the cruise was a message to the world that the United States and its Navy had arrived on the world stage and could accomplish nearly anything. Another sailor summed it up this way, We just wanted to let the world know that we were prepared for anything they wanted to kick up. We wanted to show the world what we could do. Jim Cheevers, Senior Curator of the Naval Academy Museum, now joins us for a little bit more about the Great White Fleet and its travels. Okay, we're here in the U.S. Naval Academy Museum uh, today to talk about the Great White Fleet. The Great White Fleet uh, was sent around the world by President Theodore Roosevelt to show the American flag and show the American naval prowess after the Spanish-American War. Uh, I think the most fascinating thing to me about the Great White Fleet, when it left from Norfolk, Virginia in December of 1907, was the most modern navy in the world. When it returned less than 14 months later, it was completely obsolete. Uh, the great arms race leading up to World War I, particularly between Great Britain and Germany, meant that naval uh, ships uh, were being redesigned uh, very quickly. And so uh, the Great White Fleet uh, was wonderful in showing the American flag around the world. Uh, we're very proud of its accomplishments. Uh, one of the interesting things, too, was keeping that fleet white. They were painted white in those days. And of course, their main source of fuel was coal. Coal is pretty dirty. And so it was fascinating in reading accounts of the Great White Fleet and how they had to keep those ships clean. Uh, part of the Great White Fleet vi visited Amoy, China in 1908. And it just happened to be at the time of the birthday of the Dowager Empress of China. And in the Far East, it's very common for hosts and hostess to give you a gift when you visit them. So this beautiful set of rosewood, marble, and mother-of-pearl furniture was given by the Dowager Empress of China to each of the captains of the battleships, the American battleships that visited uh, uh, Amoy at that time. Uh, the particular set here was given to the captain of the USS Wisconsin, and for many years it was on exhibit in the superintendent's quarters of the US Naval Academy. Uh, it was eventually moved over here to the museum when it was no longer hardy enough for people to sit in. Uh, and it's really uh, beautiful museum uh, specimens. 